Hi, I'm Adam. This is Kevin. And we are Tech Guys Who Invest. This is the place for business people and investors to learn all about investing. We offer a fresh perspective on what it's like to have a day job while investing. And we share lessons learned on our investing journey. Our vision is to educate and entertain you while adding tons of value to your daily commute. Welcome to our show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast, where each week we teach you how to invest wisely and safely. This week, we're talking about a topic in real estate investing that's taking a huge hit with today's economy, especially with what's happening with the pandemic. Our guest, Rachel Prince, is a real estate broker, rentalpreneur, and Airbnb specialist. She's even authored two books dedicated to all things Airbnb. They're named Airbnb Mentality and Airbnb Side Hustle. She's even created an online course titled Buy b and If you want to learn more about Rachel, check out her website, rentalpreneur.com. On this episode, you're going to hear how she's been impacted by the pandemic, her advice for investors today, and how to set yourself up for future success as an investor, especially in the short-term rental industry. So without further ado, here's the episode with Rachel Prince. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. On this week's episode, we have our guest, Rachel Prince, who is a real estate entrepreneur who's done it through Airbnb. You can call her the rentalpreneur. So, Rachel, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Here, here. Thanks, guys. All right. So, with this, climate, here. Yeah. with this climate, we want to dive right in and ask, if somebody said, hey, I know what you do with Airbnb, and they said, I want to start one, what would be your advice given everything that's happening and what might be coming in the future? Right. And so when we say what's happened, well, you know, somebody listening to this podcast uh, at a random time on your website might not understand what that random uh, or the the pandemic is. And we're talking about COVID-19. And I think a lot of us in the various markets and industries are kind of coming to that place where we're like um, pre-COVID or post-COVID. So those are kind of the common. And then during this whole episode, I I think that's the conversation that I'm having is, look, uh, you know, I just had a conversation with an investor today. Are we talking how it was and the data that we had from before that the short-term rental market as it evolved pre-COVID or are we talking post-COVID and the predictions for how it's going to be? Because right now the reality is we are right smack in the middle of it. And as I have said to him, I said, get out your popcorn Um, you know, maybe sit back a little bit, keep doing your due diligence, but now is not necessarily the time to act. Don't go out. And you know, my first, very first piece of advice would be don't go out and buy that Airbnb and set it up and furnish it and get your designer to do it and expect the return and people to come, you know, sailing into your Airbnb and booking it night after night, because that is not the market right now. In fact, it's dead. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I was going to follow died. up with that. What can you tell us a little bit about what you're going through right now? Because I think that's that's really uh, something that people are interested in. Yeah, yeah. And I and I have done a couple of you know my own podcast with this with uh, my correspondent on there, and we're just like this uh, pandemic has killed ninety percent of our business. So as short-term rental or hotel industry, hospitality industry, travel, I mean, look, we're not the only ones affected sure. by this, okay? Everybody's been affected by it, no matter what industry they're in. Um, some have even gotten busier. I know construction uh, members here in, in town who are working for companies, they've gotten busier. So everyone's been affected at some level. Um, you know, he doesn't like working from home per se. Uh, but the rest of us, like in the short-term rental markets, and that's since that's what we're we're talking about, has ultimately come to a temporary standstill. In my opinion, we are on this like incubation hold right now. I don't, you know, we don't exactly know where it's going to evolve to, and we can get into that later. But right now, since we all in the last month lost. Uh, property managers, hosts, investors who own short-term rentals, we have essentially lost 90% of our reservations, bookings, income, business, full stop. Wow. So that has uh, left owners with their mortgages 
uh, empty nests. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, if they're smart, they will be doing their due diligence right now and their research to understand how to adapt to the COVID market. And, I, and that's very important right now is how are, how is the host adapting or the property manager adapting to this market? And there's a few different ways for doing that. And we can get into those. Yeah, we'd love to get into that. One thing that I want to uh, get into before you, you mentioned that yeah. is data. You said, depending on yeah. what data you're looking at. So when you reference data, where do you, where would you recommend somebody get this information? Right. And so being in Indianapolis with about 30 properties pre-COVID, <laughs> managing, managing, I say pre-COVID for myself because now I don't have that many because a lot of people got out of the game and I'll, we'll go into that later as well and the options for what some hosts have decided to do or homeowners. But the reality is that the data for me has been typically amongst the, in the properties that I manage. It's enough to give me data uh, that I can then scale up and understand the market in a much broader way. Um, I also have other property managers in the market uh, that are, you know, are essentially doing the same thing. So we share data and we understand, you know, what's really happening now just before the the global pandemic was i mean essentially shut down the entire world and especially the united states and and the travel bans were put on i did a uh it's kind of funny because i did a little interview with fox tv and they didn't mention anything about covid you know at that time they weren't really yet admitting to it but right. i said you know it is indianapolis we are um we are um getting coming into our busy season we've got the ncaa's the big 10 and we have we have about 1500 listings here in indianapolis which is oversaturated in my opinion um over the last few years but we are looking at um 600 available units for the weekend. That, that was kind of the, 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 the Fox interview, right? And if we have 600 available units on a weekend with the NCAA and you've got 1,500 listings in Indianapolis, does that tell you something about the data in the market? Yes, yes. Absolutely. That, it, that is saying that we are oversaturated. We don't have enough um, uh, traffic or travelers to fill all those units, uh, we are oversaturated alert. There is a problem. And so that's what I was discussing. And that's where I was coming to this place in my mind, like, I'm going to have to have the conversation with, with the owners of these houses. Like over the last six months, the profits and the proceeds have not been, have not been there. We've got right. a problem. Uh, you know, and then I didn't have to have that conversation because the whole world crashed. <laughs> we had other problems. We had bigger problems. Yeah. So, uh, Rachel, you mentioned the owners there, and and we know that you're the maven of Airbnb, right? So, yes, yeah. <laughs> tell us a little bit as about my your sparkles. <laughs> as your um, tell us a little bit about your business model there. Do you own them also, or how does that all work? Yeah, I think that's a good way to preface, you know, how I'm looking at this data. These are properties that I manage from investors. I do have a couple of my own properties here in Indianapolis. Having moved from Denver, Colorado three years ago because I was at a Fortune Builders conference and because Fan Merrill was investing here <laughs> and because I had a wholesaler uh uh, who sent who sent me some data that Indy was kind of you know one of the up and comings, especially for the real estate market. I made an executive decision to move here and get invested, and you know get in on some of those eighty thousand dollars houses. I mean that was a lot for some of the people here who've been buying houses for fifteen thousand and forty thousand. But for me, eighty thousand was a steal coming from Denver, which was at the peak of its market, right? So. Yeah. Moving here and realizing, you know, that this this in this market had potential, and then ultimately, over just a short period of time, three years, watching it go from, you know, a, a like to, to maybe four times the return on our our short term rental returns and profits wow. to dwindling down to, um, you know, less just about market rent. 
you know, wow. returns. So 6%, 8% cap rate, maybe, maybe seeing a couple hundred a month in profits. It wasn't, uh, it was hard for the owners to justify it. And I apologize. I don't remember where we were going with that, but a question, but I think you were talking about market. Yeah. And just, um, just your business model. What, oh, the business you know, model with within it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So coming back to that, uh, good that you guys keep me on track. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. So with my business model, uh, you know, it started from just uh, me buying my own property to renting out my house and going and living. I, I had done a bunch of YouTube uh, videos on Airbnb. So I had a bunch of travel credit saved up. So I would go stay at other places and travel around while I was renting out my house, getting my getting back on my feet because I put everything I had into that one house. And then as I got back on my feet, I manifested and called in these big clients and I was able to manage their property for 20%. But as I became more automated with my systems and operations, I realized I didn't need 20% anymore. So I was able to reduce that to about 10 to 15%, 10 for my luxury units, right? That are bringing in 2,600 or, you know, 800 to 2,600 in a weekend, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I could reduce those to 10%, but it, typically I was offering, um, and able to scale my business quickly and get a lot of, uh, a lot of new hosts and homeowners on board, uh, for my property management company, uh, because my rates were competitive and I, and I had my systems and systems down. I had automations in place and, and that helped me scale very quickly. Um, so I, I would say, um, you know, Anyone looking to get into this game, you know, if you want to scale it, you really have to understand because it's active income, you've got to have that stuff in place. And I will mention those later because I know we were going to talk about some of the, the software or tips that I that I recommend. That's great. Awesome. And we will definitely yeah. get to that later, yes. especially the technology I know. So part. much good stuff. You guys <laughs> keep listening. So with, <laughs> you mentioned you, you were managing these properties for your clients. What are the other ways that people typically get involved with Airbnb? Um, stumbling, <laughs> <laughs> they stumble on it. Uh, maybe, you know, I, I think a lot of times it happens where literally there might not be any hotels available or the type of, of property that a guest or traveler is looking for isn't available in a hotel. Um, so they're looking for or particular types of amenities or different cities or off the beaten path. And so they stumble into it. Uh, they find a, a, an Airbnb that inspires them uh, and then they have a calling and, and feel like they, you know, maybe want to get into this business line of business. The other way would be investors. They want to expand their portfolio, diversify. And I have a lot of uh, clients that are out of state investors and they would like to uh, they wanted to get in their foot into the short term rental market sure. and see what it was all about, you know. And, um, you know, because of the COVID uh, collapse in the market, it's been really interesting to actually listen to the real estate podcasts and see what the real estate investors are doing and, and how they're handling people who can't pay rent, you know, um, how mortgages, forbearance, and things like that. I mean, what's your guys' take on? on all of that. Have you got, you guys must've done podcasts on that. Yeah, we definitely have. You want to go for it, Adam? Yeah. So on the, we're, you know, talking about larger multifamily apartments and things. Yeah. And, um, I mean, of course, part of our team are professional property managers. And, and so they have a whole plan in place for this kind of thing, disaster response. And, and so, we've been collaborating with them and just sort of executing their procedures, which mostly involve um, supporting the residents, but continuing to let them know that rents do. We have a business to run as well. And, you know, work with us. If you're not able to make the payment, um, we'll help wherever we can, but we want you to know, you know, it's still due and, yeah. um, that's, you know, it, it's a tough spot because um, some people literally can't pay. Yeah. So that's yeah. a very difficult situation. Yeah. One of the things I heard on a, a friend of mine's podcast 
was, uh, you know, just having the conversation, you know, understanding that this is a community, let's communicate here. Let's, let's have a conversation. That's the first bit. And then like, you know, by the end he was throwing out tips such as like, you know, maybe even we have some toilet paper for you if you (laughs) store it away, you know, I mean, or, but the other thing I liked was, uh, you know, just a reminder, don't, don't put any paper towels or anything down the toilet or things that might jam it. Just if you're in a tight spot, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll help you out or I'll find a way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that communication is key. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get lucky. It's like gold these days for the toilet paper. I know. I saw it in Target. <laughs> I was like, wait, 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 is that toilet paper? And there's like, you might one. get mugged. <laughs> yeah. You might get mugged That's in the a, parking lot. <laughs> I know. I got like a big, well, I just bought it. I didn't even need it. I just, bought it anyway because i was like wow this is like my right american american right <laughs> it's a manifest toilet paper so have a one to buy one roll yeah or one package yeah all right so uh, let's say when the when things kind of get back to normal and travel ban gets lifted how would you say uh the how would you recommend people who airbnb hosts stand out right you're talking about there's an oversaturation in indianapolis i'm sure that is experienced everywhere in the country before this whole thing happened. So what would you say are like the, the, the most successful hosts? What are they doing? Right. And, and I think there's an important little piece to mention before we get to that. So take a, take a moment to hold, put that thought on, on hold for a second because the more important question is, what are they doing now to make money, right? Mm, what, are they, what are they doing to uh, change what they're doing now, and then yeah, and then reemerge. What's their reemergence plan? But but right now, during it all, what we what I did, like, uh, it, it took. It, it, let's be honest. It took me a few days to. I, I got wiped. A rug got pulled out from under my feet, and sure. I, and I was in shock. And I think a lot of people were. And I didn't realize because we must have lost thirty thousand in like what a week or two, and I I think that shock had to kind of sink in before I was like, okay, what what am I going to do? Do I reach out to the homeowners first, or how do how do I pull myself together here, pull myself up by the bootstraps, and carry on with a business, you know? And um, then what I did almost immediately was cut my prices in half and uh, double my minimum night requirements, or I shouldn't say double, I should say I extended those to 30 days, 20 to 30 days minimum. So my minimum nights uh, for anyone looking to come and stay in one of our homes had now become, you know, a month to month booking essentially. And when you do 30 days, you know, you get rid of taxes. So it lowers their prices as a traveler, which is an incentive, you know. Yeah. Um, But ultimately, they're getting a great deal. You know, we've got nurses on the front line we're attending to. We've got people who couldn't couldn't leave because of the travel ban. We've got people who are having to get out of their college dorm. So we've got quite an interesting COVID market now. Uh, people who are quarantining from their families, people who are just back from traveling and needing to quarantine. So we, we have this interesting market, uh, plus other people who are looking for potentially six months leases. And so we've now moved into a different type of short-term rental or uh, month-to-month kind of operation. So we, I quickly adjusted my, uh, my bookings, my, my listings rather, to accommodate longer-term rentals and we were able to get bookings r- right away. Um, I would say about 50% occupied within the first couple of weeks of doing that. And now we're up to maybe 70%. Um, I would say the, the luxury units, a little bit harder to, to you know, lower those prices just enough and, and get the longer term bookings. So that's where I'm really having the hardest time. But for all the others, the single family dwellings, the... Uh, you know, two to four bedrooms, the small one bedroom condos or efficiency units are having a much easier time. Granted, their mortgages and utilities and just overall monthly expenses are less. And so I think that helps because now we're looking at, you know, the owner's looking at, well, when they would pay, you know, say 1100 for utilities and expenses, they're now getting 1400 let's just say. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we started to shift to that type of model 
and we've been having success with that. I do recommend that people, if they haven't already done it, they consider doing that. I think some people, you know, really like the, some of my luxury units, some, some of the homeowner, homeowners, they just don't want to lower their prices anymore. I mean, we've had offers, but he's just like, no, I'll just keep it empty for now and work on, you know, making some sprinkler changes. I got to do some things for the insurance and I've got to make some changes. It's a great time to just kind of sit back and, and reevaluate the business model or make improvements or save money if you can, where you can. But for the rest that really want to still do business and be open during this time, you've got to adjust and adapt to the type of model of travelers that, that we have right now. And that, that's generally month, month long. I mean, we had some people who didn't want to risk, you know, they had plumbing issues and stuff. Right. And so they had like two week long bookings for their whole family. But, but otherwise it's a lot of locals, locals are booking and uh, it's, it's very interesting. So the predecessor to, you know, what people are going to do in the future and what the market. Yeah. That's, like. that's pretty interesting to hear. Uh, that, that was one of my questions uh, that, that you kind of answered there about, are, are you still renting these, you know, are people still buying them? So it's interesting to hear that they are, and the, the question I really want to ask is, is a little different. It's more around being an entrepreneur and also being an investor. And, you know, Kevin and I talk a lot about mindset. And I think it'd be easy for someone to kind of let this get them down. And so it's interesting to hear that you came up with some creative options and figured that out. And, um, you know, it'd be great to hear your sort of how you did that almost like what, you yeah. know, what was your thought process or what's your That's attitude? That's why they call me that? the maven of Airbnb guys. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Rentalpreneur exactly. because listen, I'll tell you what, the, uh, I love the name Rentalpreneur because I chose that name specifically for two reasons. One is because a lot of companies chose Airbnb in their name, which then Airbnb came after them and said, you can't use Airbnb. So a lot of people switched to B&B. So you hear B&B a lot more, even though B&B is bed and breakfast. It's still the, the new terminology for vacation rentals. So I, but, but so I didn't want to be the, I didn't want to be loyal to Airbnb alone because Airbnb may or may not be forever. We just don't right. know. And then number two, I realized that if I was going to be successful in this business, that I had to be versatile and I had to be able to adapt to different markets, whether that be renting out a teepee or, you know, figuring out how to help my clients buy, uh, you know, a, a multi-unit or create a building and then rent out some of it and um, maybe commercial rent out the other space. But the, the reality is I just knew that, that, the rental and vacation rental market needed to stay diverse. And, and, and so that's kind of how that was my mindset, you know, it was like, right. don't, excuse me, don't be loyal to any one brand. Um, you know, how can, how can I create a more versatile and uh, robust type of operation? And so, nice. yeah, it paid off. I yeah, guess. that's great. Like a Swiss army knife for short-term rentals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well said. <laughs> so when people are looking to start, let's say when this thing dies down, maybe it changes back to some yeah. sense of normalcy. Uh, what are the biggest mistakes that they should avoid in, in your opinion? Yeah, well, um, you know, I think the biggest one that comes to mind is, you know, really think about two things really come to mind. Consider whether or not you should be spending $10,000 on a designer, you know, right away. Uh, I know a lot of people, I, I, I think I'm not trying to denigrate a designer's value or, or their, uh, you know, like the need for a designer. But I would say that might be an extravagance that you can't afford right now under the circumstances. You know, that's 10000 potentially $10,000 that you can save for your rainy day fund when at the end of the world, you know, to pay your mortgage right. or something, stay on top of right. those payments. Uh, so I would say, you know, the design element, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be modern and clean. And I think that that's more important. Um, but I will say that, you know, it certainly needs to be unique, Right. So if it can be, remain unique, you know, you, you have that 
cool looking space or a place that is in an area that is desirable. It, obviously, you know, people might flock to that more. So, um, so yeah, I would say, um, yeah. What would you tell somebody who's new or maybe even your younger self about things to look for when you're considering making an investment in a property that you'd like to do a short-term rental on? Yeah. And, you know, to add to the point that I was talking about, like, I think um, that is going to be kind of the, the second area is like, you know, there, there's a formula attached to buying an Airbnb vacation rental. It's not, it's not just, um, you know, how much money you can spend on how good it looks. It's, it's, it's the whole formula of, you know, where it's located, um, what purpose is it serving, what target audience um, is it serving and all that. So I would say, you know, don't just go out there, spend a lot of money on design. Don't just go out there and spend a lot of money on a house because it's priced low right now. We really don't know what the market is going to do. And it could get shut down again. Now is not the time to make that decision. So understanding that, yes, there is a formula to where and how you buy that property is contingent upon the emerging market after this happens, right? Yeah, In the right. next six months, when I would recommend when someone starts to consider buying again, that's when they want to say, um, Okay, now with this market, do I want to be buying in a non-vacation rental market? Do I want to be buying in a vacation, a destination market, right? Do I want to buy near Disneyland? Because it can get shut down, because it did. Yep. Or do I want to buy in a town like Indianapolis, where it could close down, conventions could get canceled? Or what about buying in an area like, say, you know, Denver, mountains or something where weed is legal and even if things get shut down people could go smoke smoke weed in you know cabin in the woods right so i think i think the mindset of the the future short term rental investor might shift a little bit with this in mind right the the um new emergency clause right and that's going to play a part in the formula of how to invest in one whereas that didn't really before I never, I didn't really think about that. Right. You know, I just, uh, I just saw them keep on booking conventions here in India and I'm like, great, right. great, bring it, bring it. Right. But at some point we, we all kind of stopped and are realizing like, there's a, there's a, there's kind of a new formula emerging and we all have to realize that the economy can shut down and we're leveraged high and what, what are we going to do? What's our game plan? So I think, I think this is a great time to start for a lot of hosts to investigate. Well, what is your game plan? What, what do you want? What kind of property or short-term rental do you want and who do you want to attract into it? Oh, that's a good one. You mentioned who do you want to attract? And before we dive into that particular question about figuring that out, you mentioned the emergency clause. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and define yeah, what that well, is for people? Yeah, and, and I think there's two points to the emergency clause. The first one is, you know, like I had just said, it's, it's, it's this new thing that we never thought of before, just like Airbnb, when they tried to do, give the guests refunds 100% of the cancellation fees and um, get their full refunds, leaving the host high and dry. They didn't really have an emergency clause for world pandemic. So everybody's kind of backpedaling, trying to figure out like, okay, you know, what, what do we do in emergency situations, right? Like what kind of um, operation are we running when we have an emergency and how can we adapt to it, right? It's kind of hard sometimes to think through all these things all the way in our mind. But now I think everybody has a better understanding of like, okay, what, what would happen if the world gets shut down again and what's my game plan, Right. So, um, and I think the other thing about the emergency clause is I think some people, since we are doing month to month and a lot of those are being taken off of Airbnb and just going person to business to business, right? Right. The client comes in directly to us, um, whether through for referrals or platforms or just wanting to see the place first right. and go and investigate it. Then we get them off 
off some of the rental platforms because we naturally have that relationship now. Um, is to put an emergency clause in the lease, the vacation rental lease that you're doing, right? So yeah. maybe to maybe whereas one wasn't in there before, and I don't know what Airbnb is going to do with that, but uh, maybe where was one wasn't one in there before, um, or you didn't have a vacation rental lease uh, because. You know, most people, I tell people, look, if you're going to do 30 days, just have them sign a rocket lawyer vacation rental lease. And you can write in there in a little emergency, uh, you know, extenuating circumstances clause that says no refunds under any circumstances. I mean, you can write in whatever you want and it's right. findable by law. Um, but I think the one thing to keep in mind about 30 days just a little side note here is, you know, once you get them in 30 days, they now are considered by law, you know, unevictable. You can't evict them by law, right? Interesting. So essentially they become protected by law and you might have a harder time if they don't leave. Now, yeah, you can go and change the locks. That's what I, <laughs> I thought about doing and I've done it. I've done, I've, um, I'm not with, it, it hasn't worked out like that. It's mostly just to keep them out once they're out. But, uh, but I thought about it. I thought about saying, well, you, if you're in there, the minute you go out, I'm going to go change that lock. That's been my game plan. You know, I'm just going to go change the door code. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, I think there's, there's gotta be in people's minds now as hosts and homeowners and protecting their assets, some level of, you know, what are, what is your game plan for emergencies? What is your game sure. plan? If the economy shuts down again. So, yeah. So Rachel, can you unpack that unevictable topic just yeah. a little bit? Is that is that um, related to what's going on with COVID? Because you know, yes. you're not yes. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It, well, it's not if it weren't that. Well, either way, even if it wasn't related to COVID, the pro the time that it would take to get someone evicted, especially if you're out of state investor. You have to come into state, go for the court date, try to get them evicted, then get a sheriff out there, blah, 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 blah. That takes time Yep. to, to potentially, as the sure. homeowner, be losing money on that. Um, that's why I haven't wanted to get into long-term rentals. That's why I always go 20 to 30 days or 29 days, you know? So yeah. I don't, um, don't want to get into that, but I, I also, um, like I said, I love those door locks, those smart <laughs> just in case you never know. Um, there's, there's ways of psychological disturbance with some of the alarm systems that we have and stuff. I, I, I was just kind of, my mind was racing with like, Oh, what happened if they did not leave or something, right. but it has never, ever, hasn't come to that touch wood, touch wood. But, um, that being said, um, I think there's, um, you know, if, if you had that happen to you as a host, you would have a hard time getting them out because you can't get people evicted right now. And they would fall into that category under right. by law, by, you know, the degree yeah. of the president. Yeah. Now you mentioned, we kind of uh, talked about cert knowing who you serve and who you target. Can you elaborate on how somebody would go about figuring out, Oh, these are the types of people that I want my Airbnb to target, et cetera. Yeah. Well, in my online course, I do talk about this because it's not just, I can't just uh, tell someone, you know, think about who your target market is. It, it's a pretty deep conversation, sure. right? But uh, so in my online course, I do talk about that. I have a whole chapter on mindset and getting into the understanding of like, who are you attracting and who are you as a short-term rental host? What does that look like? for, you know, the individual. And once they kind of go through a little process to come to the conclusions of, of who they are trying to attract, they often find out that it, it's in general, like themselves, right? It's the kind of person that they are themselves, right? They want, maybe some people want a luxury brand or luxury guest, or some people want a, uh, you know, a party, more, you know, social type of venue or others just want the traveling professional and they're, right. you know, and I think that oftentimes reflects like, excuse me, who they are, you know, mm -hmm. as an individual for me personally, uh, with my mission being a, to be a steward for the planet and for people with their real estate properties, my goal is to teach conscious travelers and attract in conscious minded travelers. So 
throughout the process of my messaging in my automations and my communication to them and the uh, everything from having a salt rock lamp or something that is a method soap or something um, eco-friendly in the house is all kind of threads, has this thread of, of, of conscious minded traveler and what goes along with teaching them and coaching them and helping them understand if they're not homeowners, how do you respect a home? How do you respect your, the cleaners that are coming in to clean up after you? And what are your duties and obligations as a conscious minded traveler? You know, the leave no trace and leave it better than you found it principles. And I think once people, you know, I've trained, I've hosted almost 5,000 guests overall. And I would say that, you know, it's a process. Sure. <laughs> it's a process. It's, it, I think I'm doing my fair share to ultimately give back to the community to say, um, it, it's my contribution, if you will, to yeah, just absolutely. help the planet a little bit, you know, where I can. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Now, one thing that we wanted to also ask is, let's say a busy professional is looking to diversify their portfolio as far as investments. What would you say to them would be the advantages of investing in Airbnbs? Yeah, well, um, I wouldn't, I think before that conversation, because a lot of people come to me now and say, um, I want to invest in Indianapolis and, you know, when this is done, you know, can I come to you and this and that. And I, and I think before that I'm telling them, let's have that conversation later because more importantly, I would like them to go back to the drawing board and really analyze like, yeah, what is it that they're trying to get out of this? You know, is it purely financial? Because I don't know if at least in some markets, you know, especially when they're highly saturated and there's not a lot of, there's too much inventory. I don't know if, if that's going to be the right setup for them anymore. Uh, you know, I, I have to understand about them and understand, are, you know, are you in it for just the return or are you looking to preserve your asset, you know, so that your house is kept in good condition? Cause we can really work on that. You know, we can get you a nice, healthy return. Maybe it's not, you know, four times anymore, the amount, uh, but it's, it's your place is going to be respected. It'll be cleaned regularly. It will be well kept. You will preserve it for the long-term appreciation. You will have uh, a solid flow of bookings and people in and out. You know, is that worth it to you? Or maybe are they looking for something really creative and and just so unique, you know, I think for me, that's what interests me now. I don't want to, I don't want to just have another house with an Airbnb. I want to really do my next project. I'm looking to do something, you know, really cool and maybe more off the beaten path, you know, yeah, something makes and, sense. and mix I, it up, mix it up between long, long months to months and, and the short term just to protect it. Yeah. I like what you were saying in there really about, um, you know, knowing what your goals are and yeah. then aligning to those. It, it makes total sense. And Kevin and I talk about that a lot for establishing your investor identity. So that's, that's yeah. right in line with what we say. That's great. So um, we wouldn't be the tech guys who invest if we didn't ask you about technology. <laughs> yes. <Tech, laughs> All tech. right. So uh, Rachel, tell us what a cool piece of technology you've encountered in the Airbnb spaces. Yeah, and I will say this, that my parents don't call me Electronica for nothing. <laughs> um, and as I alluded to this in the beginning, uh, technology and automation is how I was able to scale my business from zero to six figures within six months, okay? So that was crucial for, for that process because like this is an active business. This is an active business model. You're working 24 seven. If you know, I mean, I, you need resources in this business. Right. So one of the things that um, it may or may not be considered technology, I consider it technology is uh, if you have over five properties, maybe even over three, I, 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 but uh, just is, it depends on the person. 
but you need an answering service. You need okay. to have an answering service to save you because you cannot be on, on call 24 seven. We right. need that time off. One thing about the COVID world has taught us is that we need time to breathe. We need time to relax and recover and recuperate while, you know, everything still keeps going. You do not, you can't be taking those calls at midnight to find where the iron is or <laughs> the hot water is not working. No, these are first world problems. They can wait till the morning. Or if you have an answering service that's 24 seven, you know, that, and it's, it's very affordable. Okay. That was, it was actually one of the first things I cut because I didn't need it in the COVID world. However, um, it was also one of the most affordable things, you know, for all my properties, I was able to do it for under, under 200 bucks a month under, you know, almost hundred. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's um, cool. I, I like that. Cause it's unique. I mean, that's not something we hear from everyone. So pretty absolutely. Neat. even in the, even in the, if you're a real estate investor, as a property manager, you could still have an answering service. Let's say you have a hundred doors, you could still have an answering service. It's incredible. They only call you or text you, you know, in emergencies, otherwise they email you. And to me, that is, it is a lifesaver, game changer. Um, awesome. Yeah. And, and the other thing is you, uh, again, with a couple properties, I would, I, I wouldn't, I would do one property with it, but I would, I would have a channel management system, automation messaging system, a channel manager, and a, a, a property management software system in place, not only to push your data for, uh, to different channels like Verbo and HomeAway and FlipKey and Travelocity and Expedia and Airbnb, but also to create automations in your tasks to your cleaners, messages to your your guests and um, have a multi calendar that is easy to change. I was trying to explain it today and I do recommend I was using your reporter, but it was so glitchy. I, I finally just had to give up on it. I tried, I tried for years and I just, uh, I love them. I love you guys, but Hey, I'm sorry. I've now switched over to host away. Host away is um, the, the property management software and channel manager that I now am using. I just got set up. It's a great time, great time <laughs> to switch over your automations right now because we've got so much downtime. So this is a great time to do that. And so I did, I've been doing that and a uh, little, you know, working out the bugs, but having, um, having a reliable automation system is key. I've done my research over and over and over. I just could not find one that I liked. And I really pushed these guys to, to say, this is what I need. I don't have this. I'm not seeing this. I need this in order to work with you guys. They've come back several times. And finally, I feel like I just got to dive in and start working with them. So I've, I've made the switch over to host away and I I'm, you know, a lot of these guys are European companies. They have a, a European tech, European coders. Um, mm -hmm. I know they're also based out of Canada. Uh, you know, like, makes it more questionable with the, 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 uh, um, the servers. And I'm like, sure. are they going to keep up? Are they going to be fast enough? And so I think that, um, these are all things that are still, you know, relatively new to the short-term rental world, you know, you know, softwares and automations and channel pushers. Um, we're still innovating in this industry. Is it perfect? No, but it will save your ass because it is going to give you time to rest. And you're not, you know, let's say you're finally get that time to go out to dinner with your friends and family. You'll be able to do that without getting interrupted and having to leave to message someone. So nice. That's great. And a nice a little pro tip in there about using this time to switch over. So, Absolutely. so that's great. Uh, Rachel, thanks so much for coming on. It's It's been an, uh, fantastic to have you on. Where could people find out more about you or reach out to you? Thank you. Yes, I appreciate the, that. And uh, it's, it's so fun to be on here with you guys, Kevin and Adam. Thank you so much. And um, I, I believe the easiest way is going to my website, rentalpreneur.com. And there on Rentalpreneur, you can learn about the different things that I, um, I'm up to, including my online uh, Airbnb real estate investing or vacation rental re investing course that's available on their buy BNB or buy BNB.net. So thanks, guys. Awesome. Yeah, we'll encourage everybody to check that out. We'll put that in the show notes. And uh, 
Great. Thanks so much. Absolutely. You guys take care now. You too. See you on the flip side. (laughs) That's it for this episode of Tech Guys Who Invest. This is Adam. And this is Kevin. Thank you so much for listening to us. Don't forget to join our Facebook page where we're building a community of investors so that we can share ideas, tips, and other ways to help us get out of the rat race. If you found value in this podcast, it would mean the world to us if you could share it with your network. Lastly, we love feedback. It's how we get better. So if you wouldn't mind spending 30 seconds and leaving us an honest review on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform you're using, that would be super sweet. If you want to get on Adam or Kevin's calendar, go to tgwipodcast.com slash contact. We want to help you invest safely, wisely, and ultimately get you out of the rat race. Thanks again.